topic for today is how to write a good protocol. And before we start and dive into the topic, I have a short survey for you. Uh, how many protocols and maybe laboratory protocols have you written so far in your life? And I've prepared my browser here somewhere with a survey and maybe can set this to one minute. This should be enough to answer this question. And then there should be some QR code here. And I can maybe try to enlarge this a little bit and set the browser to full screen mode. And at this time, I also say hello to the two people watching on Twitch. Um, let me know if this works for you. Write something nice in the chat. You can also participate in the survey, of course. And let me know if your audio works today because I'm using a new microphone and I had some problems with this using it on my cell phone, but I think on my computer it worked a little better. And uh, okay. What is bothering me is that it's this says zero attendees. Does it work? Does it did it work for you? Okay. Four, four persons and we have four results. And now I have to check because this, the dark blue one is the result from today. And I think this was the one from the workshop half a year or one year ago. So, okay, we have some persons saying they don't have written any protocols so far and, and some a few, and we don't have any person saying more than 10. I don't know who was the one last time or who have the persons been last time and why they attend this workshop, but okay. Okay, and then I think um, what I'm trying to tell you today should be interesting for you. So I will, of course, give a brief motivation and then we can really dive into this topic, how to write a good protocol. And I've tried to separate my advice that I'm trying to give you into content and into style. So we will a little bit look about this. Uh, then what is maybe some interesting part, we will look at some good and bad examples. As I usually say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, so these are examples from former protocols of students. And maybe once again, the motivation why we do and why we why we did and, and um, develop this workshop. And then I'm a big fan of LaTeX, as maybe some of you know, also these slides have been um, developed or generated in LaTeX. And we can look at some examples there from electrical engineering, how to write or how to um, generate diagrams, plots. And there's a special package for this called PGF plots. And then how to draw circuit diagrams, which is also from my point of view, kind of interesting. And at the end, of course, there will be a summary. Okay, so the motivation is if you study at a university, at least at the German university, and if you do your bachelor studies, you have to do lots of laboratory internships, do experiments, and you have to write protocols for these experiments. Um, and so if you do this, you gain lots of experience and knowledge on how to do this, and this will help you a lot for your upcoming, this is at least what I can tell to the German students for your upcoming bachelor's thesis and also for the master's thesis. And to be honest, I've also hated this as a student because it consumes lots of time. If you every week have to prepare for some experiment and you have to conduct the experiment and then you also have to write the protocol, it consumes lots of time, but you, you gain lots of knowledge on how to do this. And it really, really helps a lot. And it pays off towards the end of the study when you have to, um, when you have to write a degree thesis. And also if you work as a professional engineer, you, do, you will do lots of, um, experiments, simulations, and so on. And there you also have to write technical reports, let's say, which are kind of longer protocols, something like this. And the, the purpose, the goal of all these documents is that you, hello, come in, that you, that you document your experimental procedure and that you describe, let's say, the knowledge that you, that you got out of these experiments by discussing your observations and discussing your results. And in general, from a, from a good protocol, someone else who was not present at the day of the experiment should be able to reproduce your experiment and to, to replicate your results. I mean, then it's written in a, in a good and sufficient understandable way and so on and so on. 
Okay, so now the question is, how do we do this? And as said, let's look into the content in first. And as every technical paper and maybe most of the engineering thesis, there is usually a very generic structure. For the German students, this is also usually given by the instructions of the course. So in, 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 in your laboratory courses that you need to do, you, you get some kind of structure like this, right? Yeah. So it's, it's somewhere given as a manual. And so there's usually a cover page. Uh, we will go into the details, some section describing some theoretical fundamentals and some, some things that you might have to do in advance for the preparation of the experiment, maybe some calculations before, something like this. Then you, you describe, as I said, the experimental procedure and uh, discuss the result. And for analyzing the results, as well as for the theoretical fundamentals, you might use external sources as in, your, as in the research paper, as in the degree thesis. So there will be some section with literature references and maybe some declaration of authorship that you need to sign that this is really your work and your report and so on. And maybe some appendix with scanned, with your scanned handwritten notes from the day of the experiment. Maybe, maybe not. So on the cover page, there's usually a template. You give all the relevant information. What is your name? What is the university? What is the course? Who was the supervisor? And so on and so on. Um, just stick to this template and fill it in completely. So there, there, there's no, no questions necessary back and forth and so on. Um, then for the theoretical fundamentals, also a little bit like in a master thesis, um, you should describe for some educated reader. So an, an educated reader is, let's say, a person that has general knowledge of your field of study, let's say electrical engineering, what additional information would such a person need to know to understand your specific experiment and your specific procedure and observations and so on. So um, I don't know, for example, if you do some experiment about resonance circuits or so on, you can probably assume that everyone knows about Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and about Ohm's law, and so on, because this is basic knowledge in electrical engineering. But you, in this theoretical section, then, for example, it would be good to repeat what is the resonant behavior of such a resonant circuit, something like this, what, is, what extends the, the basic common knowledge of every electrical engineer, let's say. And you will copy there from, or you will, you will get, borrow information from external sources, so you should cite these sources and make it as long as necessary, as short as possible, let's say, as, as the usual saying is. And don't make it too general, too broad. I said, don't repeat everything. Yeah, you can assume that everyone knows Ohm's law, for example. And um, don't have a too detailed derivation of formulas because then it just gets too lengthy if you show every each and every step. If it's really necessary, you can put it into some appendix maybe. And then for the, um, I know for the German students, you get kind of detailed instructions for the experiment. Of course, you don't need to, um, or you should not copy from these instructions because your supervisor will know. And I mean, so I had, I have supervised when we still had this uh, lots of experiments in electromagnetic compatibility and for example, for measurements in reverberation chambers, which is my field of research. And so there it happened from time to time that students in their laboratory protocols would try to explain me, let's say what the reverberation chamber is and how it works. Uh, so you, you can assume that if you, if you do a laboratory uh, experiment, that your supervisor knows in general how, this, how the laboratory works. So you do, don't, do not need to have to explain to your, your supervisor how the laboratory works. Um, at least not if you have not specifically asked to do this. Of course, if, if you get asked, can you, can you please explain this, the, the, the 
test environment, the measurement environment in your own words and in your own understanding, then you should do this, but, uh, but not from yourself, let's say. Okay, then for the preparation, um, do it timely. Usually, if it's getting super complicated, then you're doing something wrong. Th this is what I mean here by uh, also don't be too creative and just check your exercise lecture notes. The, the answer should be somewhere in there. So then for the experimental procedure and the discussion and evaluation and so on of the results, there might be some subtasks given in the instructions, subtask A, subtask B, subtask C, just stick to this categorization, let's say. Um, then we will see in examples, try to use some, this is also useful in your, in your degree thesis or reports, try to use some introductory sentences yeah, in this section I'm going or we are going to discuss this and that and so on. Um, of course, units should be given correctly. Equations in most cases are numbered. Why it's a good idea to number equations? Yeah, so that you can refer to certain equations and say, now we take equation one and two and combine them together to get this new equation. Um, and why it's, and this is the same reason, of course, why it's a good idea to number figures and tables. And for figures and tables, there's a second reason um, to number them because figures and tables are usually inserted as, um, as floating objects. And floating objects means, um, so I will just grab a book here or some manual of the projector, I think. And let's say this would be, this would be your, your protocol, this would be your thesis. And the thing is, if you have some text, some text, some text, and now you would here at this part, you would like to insert, um, and maybe I can stop sharing my screen for a second to make the video larger. Let's say at this section, at this part, you would like to insert the figure. And if the figure does not fit onto this page anymore, what a good document typesetting editing program like LaTeX will do is the figure is a floating object. The figure will go to the next page and text from the next page will go to here to fill up this white space. So if you place a figure somewhere, the figure must not necessarily be at exactly this position. The figure can go a little forward or can go a little backward to a place where the figure fits. And that's why you, you, you cannot really say this and this is shown in the following figure, or this and this is shown in the figure before, because the figure does not necessarily need to follow this specific position. Um, and I mean, that's why it's a good idea, and I will share my screen once again, to, to number these figures and always say this and this is shown in figure one, this and this is shown in figure two, and then the person needs to check, okay, where this figure is the same as for tables, um, and of course, you should remain as technically and scientifically accurate as possible. Don't make vague, fake statements, um, at least not in the, let's say, in the, in the discussion of your results. Maybe if it's about measurement uncertainty or uh, measurement errors, then you can try to say it could be like this and could be like this, but um, usually you should try to be ex as exact and as accurate as possible. And then um, for the discussion of your results, then it's of course interesting to discuss such uncertainty, such um, inaccuracies, some deviations, what do you got results that were different than your expectations and what could be reasons why your results deviate from your expectations from maybe what you have calculated before, what are sources of errors, how you could improve your measurement setup and something like this. Then if you cite sources, if you give literature references, um, each reference should contain the name of the author or the authors. There should be the title of the source, 
um, there should be a date or a year when the source has been published. I mean, just that the reader has some idea, is this a very actual source, is it some older source? And there should be a way of how to access the source. And nowadays, this is a URL, some unified resource locator or some DOI, some digital object identifier. And let's say 20, 30 years ago, if this is a book, then it would be what is the publisher, what is the address of the um, address of the publisher of the book. Um, and for books, sometimes it's meaningful to have this ISBN number. It's, some people say it's not really part of the list of references. I would argue, okay, if it helps someone else to find this book, then maybe also giving this ISBN number is a good idea. Uh, but but usually today, everyone everything has this digital object identifier. And so these are would be good examples of good citations. And by the way, these are also other books and um, resources that you could use. So there's a, a nice book from uh, Martha Davis here and some co-authors, scientific papers and presentations. And this second book here from this couple, Lutz and Heike Hering, is quite interesting because there's also a German version of this available. I mean, as you can, um, these are typically German names. And they have written the book at first in German, and later on, they also translated it into English. And it's kind of interesting because you could have the same book in German and in English, um, two, two, two bilingual versions. And this is also some German publisher here. And then if you, um, I think here, this is also exactly this format. Um, if you, if you want to know more information about how to format, now we are already slightly going into format, if, how, how to format this list of references for English publications, English speaking publications, international publications, I would always use this IEEE citation format because later on, if you will publish some paper in electrical engineering, it's very, very likely that it will be published at some IEEE journal, IEEE transactions on something, uh, IEEE magazine, IEEE conferences, and then everywhere you will use this IEEE format. And I think it's it's a very good format and it's um, commonly agreed on how that, that, that this is a good format that you can use. Because the, the thing is that sometimes each and every chair uh, kind of invents its own format how to um, how to properly format this. So the, the, the first name should be like this and the family name should be like this. And then there should be a comma and there should be a dot and there should be a column and there should be something like this. And this should be in italics. I would say, don't care, just use this IEEE format and you will be fine. And so here at this, at the link that is mentioned here, you will find this IEEE citation reference. Okay, and also on our website, uh, there is this document. Maybe I can shortly go to our website. Um, because, well, let me go to the first page. This is our the website of our chair. I will switch to the English version. If my browser allows me to do so, there, there it is. And now, if you if you go to study and if you um, scroll down a little bit here, there are these LaTeX templates, and there's some German and English version, and there's also some guidance on the preparation of degree thesis. So you will find the PDF file, and you also find the LaTeX source there. This is also available on Overleaf if you want to edit it there, and there are also some more examples. Um, on how to do this within this document. And then for the appendix, I think this is only relevant for the German students. Um, during the experiment, you might take notes um, and you insert your handwritten, scanned, or today probably you would just take a cell phone, make a good picture of your handwritten notes and insert them, take care that there's good contrast, brightness, uh, proper resolution, and so on. And maybe if it's necessary, the visible signature of your supervisor or advisor of the experiment. 
Okay, so then we can take a look into style. And the general rule is um, a protocol is also something like a small degree thesis. So you can take the same template as you would use for your as you would use for degree thesis, for master thesis, for bachelor thesis. And this is um, the same document that I've just shown you, this guidance on the preparation of degree thesis. I can once again shortly go into my browser. So in this document, um, you will find the general structure and it's there's some content in there, how to write such a report. And at the same time, it's also formatted like such a report. So there's also some information on, into the content uh, onto the, or about the content and about the layout of such document and some tips on proper software, some checklists for yourself and so on. Okay, so now we can discuss this a little bit. So for diagrams, a good diagram should of course contain proper labels of the axis, including uh, let's say the physical quantity that is displayed, the unit that is displayed. If there is more than one curve, there should be a legend. It's very helpful to have a grid so that you can see if some values are above or where, 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 you, where you have certain values in this diagram. And such diagrams should be inserted as a vector graphic. So um, if you zoom in, they, they should always look perfect like this. Um, we, we will see not so good examples um, later on in the examples section. The same is for tables. So tables also should have a clear caption, um, should have um, meaningful labels for the columns and rows that are displayed there, including physical quantities and units and, and the clear number format, um, something like this. Then these tables and diagrams should have a meaningful caption. For figures, the caption is usually below the figure. And for tables, this caption is usually above the figure. Um, why, why it's maybe better to have the caption for tables above the table and not below. <clears throat> I mean, this way you can also more or less directly distinguish between this is a table and this is a figure, but, um, Yeah, but the I think the reader could also get this basic understanding of the table if the caption would be below the table, but tables sometimes tend to be long. And sometimes if you have very long tables, it's uncommon, but it could happen this, that the table goes over one and a half pages. And then it does not make too much sense if you have the table and the table, and then at the end you get the caption, what this table is really about. So that's why tables have the caption above the table, and figures are not that long. Figures don't run over several pages. Um, and so that's why they can also have the caption below the figure. This is what we already discussed. And um, I would have these table captions and figure captions also better too long than too short because um, a picture says a thousand words. For itself and figures are also some kind of let's say the first class citizens of your protocol of your report of your thesis because if someone else maybe your supervisor or the professor or some other faculty member has not much time and the same is what you do if you don't have much time you want to read a book you want to read a paper you want to read a report you don't have much time what do you do you skip through the pages and you look at the figures, and just by looking at the figures, you try to get some idea what is written there in this paper, in this report. Will it be helpful for my work or not? Is it, is it worth investing the time to read the full article, let's say? And that's why your, your, your figures should look really good. And the, the figures should be, let's say, self-explaining. And that's why it's sometimes good to have a longer caption 
that really explains all the details um, of a certain measurement setup and um, under which conditions um, a figure has been generated or, or the data has been captured, has been the simulation has been done and so on and so on. Then of course, um, what happens if you have very long captions, you, you usually don't want to have the super long captions running over several lines in your list of figures. So in at least in LaTeX, I think it's probably also possible in Word, you can have a long and a short version of this figure caption. You can have a long figure caption version directly below the figure, and you can have a shorter version of this figure caption going into the list of figures. So that the list of figures won't be that super long. And don't use this JPEG compressed raster graphics for figures uh, or for diagrams for, for all line art graphics, because it just looks not that good. So then um, some further hints, of course, if you use uncommon abbreviations, explain them, introduce them on the first use. Um, I think I would say the only common abbreviation in electrical engineering is DC and AC. Everyone knows what DC and AC stands for, but except from this, um, I would explain each and everything. Then if you have, let's say, if you have a figure somewhere and much, much, much later on the text you refer to the to this figure, it would be good not to show, not to just say this and this is shown in figure one, but also say if, if you are on page 10 or so, this and this is shown in figure one on page three, so that the reader does not need to skip lots of pages to find this figure one. Mm. And there, there are commands for this in LaTeX also. You can refer to a certain figure, and there's also a page ref command where you can refer to a certain page where this figure is placed on. So in, in probably also on Word, but I, I don't have a clue on Word. In, in LaTeX, it's fairly easy to do this. So this is really, uh, they, if, you, if you follow this advice or if you follow these rules, this is really where a supervisor could see someone has really taken care of. Um, if you write something, this and this is shown in figure one, and the figure is the last word of the line, and then the one follows on the next line, this is looking bad because this figure and the one, they belong together. They should not be separated by a line break. And there's something that you can do in each and every document type setting system. You can have a non-breaking space. You can put a space between figure and the number, between equation and the following number, table and the following number. So they will always stick together. Even if they are at the end of the line, they will stick at the end of the line or they will both move to the next line, but they will not never be separated uh, from each other. And then take care. If you break up words, you should use a hyphen. If you have sentences where you insert some part into the sentences and then the sentence continues, let's say you use a longer dash. So a hyphen is the short thing. The dash is the longer one. In engineering documents, it's very uncommon to have references at footnotes at the bottom of the page. In other, in the human sciences, it's very common to do so. Not in engineering sciences, we always put references towards the end of a document, and and then insert these the citation in, in brackets. And for electronic symbols, use the common symbols. Don't invent your own symbols. Let's say there's a nice list on the English Wikipedia. Maybe I can click on this for. A second, uh, my computer seems to be kind of slow with how to uh, how to draw circuit diagrams. What are the proper um, symbols there? Then, if we talk about units, there is a nice brochure called the SI brochure of the BIPM. The and my French is really bad. Uh, I apologize. The Bureau International de and measures, something like this. So the International Bureau of uh, Units and Measurements, something like this. And so it's, I don't know, it's a hundred page brochure. And so I've tried to condense the most important content of the hundred pages onto this one slide. So the, the main important rule is units are always written in upright letters. So Mathematical symbols, quantities, and formulas, they are written slanted. 
units are always written upright. So if you have um, a lower case M and if it's slanted, if it's in italics, then it's the mass, the, the, the quantity of the, the weight, the mass. And if it's upright, then it's the meter. And so it's really important to take care of this because it's the only way to distinguish between this. So every variables, parameters, physical quantities that you have somewhere in formulas, they are written slanted. All units that you have everywhere, they are always in Roman type and upright letters. So then, so this is, this is right, this is wrong. So then there's more stuff that is written upright. For example, if you have these indexes and if they are not variables itself, but abbreviations words like max for maximum, then they are also written in upright letters. If you have functions that have a special meaning like sine, cosine, logarithm, maximum, something like this, then also the sign is written upright. This is wrong if you write it like this. Then you if, if you have constants. So the E here is not a variable. It's a constant. It's a fixed number. It's Euler's number. It's 2.7 something. So this is also written upright. And the D here, this is also not some arbitrary D, not some diameter, not some variable parameter D. It's, it's some operator. It's a differential operator that acts on this function F and calculates the derivative with respect to X. And so, because it's some, it's some operator, this is also written in upright letters. Then there should be always a space between the number and the unit. Can also be a thin space, but the space is there to show there's a multiplication happening. We multiply the number with the unit. Um, and then if you write longer documents, of course, it's good to have the consistent format. So not sometimes write kilometers per hour like this. And the next sentence, write kilometers per hour like this, decide for one of these formats. And um, don't give units in square brackets. This is also sometimes what you see in books, but it's bad style. Then rather say unit is given in volt or is divided by volt. Because this is from a mathematical point of view more more correct to write it like this and use a good number format. Um, for example, with this power of 10 here and don't use this direct output that you get from MATLAB or Octave or Python instead, let's say. And there are nice um, um, latex packages that do the work for you. So there's a latex package uh, called SI unit X. So units within this SI system, System International, and the X, I think, stands for extended also. Uh, I will, I, it will be part of the tips for LaTeX. And there you can, um, you can give this, you can input this in LaTeX, and you will get this as, as the output. So LaTeX will automatically tear, take care of all the formatting for you. Okay, so this brings us to a second poll. Um, and I will need to I, I need to find it on the in the browser. Um, so it should be somewhere here. And I will once again start it for one minute. And here's the QR code. So question is, which document editing, typesetting, software, word processing software are you currently using to write something like this, like, like protocols? Or what, what would you probably use? And once again, hello to the now five people watching on Twitch. Um, let me know if this works for you, if you can see everything and he hear me well, but my microphone, I think is looking good. Okay, so uh, I don't know how much time there's left. I will maybe close the QR code 10 seconds. And so we will wait for this further 10 seconds and then take a look at the result. 
And the, the options that you could choose from is uh, Word, which probably we have once again, now, now we have six attendees. So I think, and maybe it was a multiple choice question. So we have three people saying Word and two people saying Letech, also maybe on Overleaf, and two people have said something else. Okay, would be interesting to, to know what is, what is the something else. Ah, Google Docs, okay. Ah, Cyflow. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've not mentioned Cyflow here, but um, Google Docs, from my point of view, is is, is very good uh, because of the interface and because the, the options that you have for collaboration and with all the document history and stuff. But I think it's not super strong for, let's say, for scientific documents. Um, so the formula editing options and so on are kind of limited, but, and, and of course you have all these data privacy issues, security constraints that are maybe associated with Google. Uh, but at the end, I think it's a good system and SciFlow, um, I mean, it's a company from Magdeburg. It's kind of a spin-off or kickoff of our university. And I would say it's also quite a good system. It's based on some XML format and I mean, what they do at the end is they also have this online editor like Overleaf and you can also separate content from styles. So you can write your content and then you can output it into different formats. Um, and it's it's working good. It's good, but I think it may be more weaker than LaTeX. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the advantage of LaTeX is just that it's, I don't know, now 30 years old, um, at least in the more or less current version. So there have been billions, probably, I don't know, at least millions of documents written with LaTeX. And for each and every problem, someone has found a solution some, at some time. And, and hopefully it's somewhere documented on Stack Exchange and so on. And so, um, yeah, LaTeX, LaTeX for sure is, from my point of view, the most, one of the most powerful systems to do this. Okay, so yeah, there is uh, there, are, there are programs that do this. What you see is what you get format, like Word, like LibreOffice, OpenOffice. Then there is there are these systems like like LaTeX, and on Windows you would use MicTeX, on Linux systems you would use Tech Live that do this kind of programming style of writing documents. Yeah, you have to know some some of these commands. And you, you just write text and then you generate the output later on. And there's something in between. Um, and the abbreviation here stands for what you what you see is what you mean. For example, this Lux Scientific Workplace, Bakoma Tech. I'm not sure if people are really still using these systems. It's and so who's using over? Is using someone using Overleaf here? And do you use it in the plain text editor or use this rich text editor where you directly see this is bold, this is a heading, this is... Okay. Okay. Because, I mean, so the, I think since some years, there are also quite good latex editors that directly show, try to show you during writing what is the heading? How will this look like? And so on and so on. But okay, it's um, people are just used to a certain way how to do stuff, and I'm used to I just write text, and I can I can also pass the formulas in my head. And if someone does a PhD thesis defense presentation at our chair, and if we have the party at the evening, we also we always play. Um, electromagnetic compatibility Jeopardy, you know, the Jeopardy quiz, the, the former quiz show that was on television. And there are always questions on LaTeX. Um, and there's a formula given as a LaTeX source code, and you have to pass the formula in your head and then give the result of the calculation, something like this. Uh, yeah, but so I'm, I'm really used to this way. I think this is not super strong for scientific documents. This is maybe the future here. Um, programs that do this, what you see is what you mean. This is a, an, an older XKCD comic on the trustworthiness of information by file extension. You can see the tech is right on top and the, the GIF or GIF is right at the bottom. And okay, the doc format is somewhere in between. Um, yeah, but 
is of course no scientific study. It's just fun. Okay, so um, some advice for figures, at least software that I have used in the past and that I found quite useful is this DIA for diagrams because there you can generate vector graphics and you can export them directly as a vector graphic um, and insert them into your document. This IPE is also something quite nice because there you can also directly generate um, latex input for, for labels, for example, into some figure schematics diagrams like this. Then for general vector graphic problems, I can recommend, this is really a program that I use a lot, Inkscape. Um, this is very handy if you have um, an SVG file scalable vector graphic and if you want to convert it into PDF or vice versa, if you want to edit um, vector figures, this is a quite handy tool. And for photographs, I use this XN view a lot mm, to crop figures, to resize figures, to maybe adjust brightness, contrast, um, something like this. And I mean, these are all Windows programs. Today, I think there are also lots of good programs that you could just use online in a browser and a, a, a modern cell phone also has, has lots of software, at least for photo editing pre-installed on it. So um, this is maybe, um, maybe, maybe old stuff, let's say. Then useful latex packages. Um, there's a, so there's a, I don't know, a huge list of latex, latex packages. So the, the, the most common ones that I use a lot and that are um, in most cases enabled in, in our templates that we give out to students is this HyperRef. And this activates links and um, PDF commands in your document. So this HyperRef, for example, does that I could click on this button here, click on this button, and it will go back and forth in my PDF document. Or in the, let's see if this works, if I go back to our thesis document here, and you see that in the list, in the table of contents, these entries that are, that they are also active links. So I could click on tables and then I would go to the section where tables are described. And this is what this HyperRef package does. AMS is the American Mathematical Society. They have a package on uh, typesetting of equations, which is very powerful. This is the already mentioned package for formatting units within the system international, the international unit system. This PGF plots and circuit ticks, we will have a look in some minutes in this further tips for LaTeX. And the circuit ticks is based on a more general package that some German guy has written, Till Tantau is his name. And it's kind of a stupid abbreviation or, or backronym or whatever you would call this because it, it says um, Tix is kind Zeichen program, which would translate into Tix is not a drawing program, something like this. And it, it's not a drawing program because at the end, you also have to like program your figure. You have to say, I want to have this element here and this element there, and they are maybe connected with each other by some arrow, something like this. But it's very, very handy from my point of view to generate these um, technical, technical figures, flow charts, um, circuit diagrams, something like this. CS quotes gives you consistent quotation marks and the site package is there for citations. And later you can also do citations without the site package, but the site package does lots of nice stuff. If you, if you cite many sources, many sources at one time, and usually it would say this is given in source three, four, five, six, then the site package would combine this and, and say, this is given in source six to uh, three to six. It, it would shorten this format and do lots of stuff like this. Okay, and as software, I use this Technic Center a lot. I think there are lots of other nice editors today. Most people use Overleaf, at least for shorter documents. And if you are, um, if you are running into these compilation timeout errors on Overleaf, 
Uh, our university, unfortunately, does not have the professional version. Maybe we will have it in a year or so. I'm I'm constantly working towards this with our rectorate to to make them aware of this issue. Um, thing is, if you are an IEEE member, you can log in into Overleaf with your IEEE account, and then you get uh, a pro license over your IEEE account. And as a student, IEEE account is only. 30 euros a year or so. Some Overleaf professional license is 300 euros or something like this a year. So the yeah, IEEE account is much cheaper. <laughs> the IEEE membership and you get the, the, the Overleaf professional license for, for free, let's say. Okay, so then we can take a look at some good and bad examples. And I will always show you the example. Uh, th these are examples from German students, but I think it's not really necessary to understand the German content. Um, so this is the first example. And I will maybe zoom in a little bit. Um, and you can try to tell me what this, what this, what, what can be improved in this example, what is maybe not that good in this example. Yeah. Oh, and what exactly do you mean by alignment? Yeah, you mean this should be uh, the 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 lines should all end at the same position here. Yeah, make makes sense. Um, at least for longer written text, it's usually a way that you have this block uh, format. Some other ideas? You, you mean this one here? No? Abgleichbrücke here, you mean this one here? There, there, there should be some, some, some vertical space you mean between here? Yeah, could be. Other comments, other ideas? Maybe, yeah, I think the equation the equations follow later here in this in this in this document. I would say the main problem here is we have the same font each and everywhere because this this is something like the title of the the experiment. This is the main heading of this document. And then this is like the first section. And this is maybe like a subsection and another subsection and another subsection and another subsection. And then there's a second section somewhere here. And there's text in between, of course. But for, for each and every text part inside this document, the very same font type and font size is used. So it would be, it would look much better. Let me try to uh, zoom back to normal. So to format it like this, it's the very same content, but just formatted in a different way. So the, the main heading is larger and more pronounced and more visible. And then we have this first section and then we have these subsections, sub or subparagraph titles in bold letters and the text like text. Okay, so second example. And the second example is a good example for even in, even in LaTeX, you can make it horribly wrong. Because people who are familiar with LaTeX will notice, okay, this is the standard, this is the standard LaTeX computer modern LaTeX font. Um, and this should be Inhaltsverzeichnis translates into table of contents. So this should be a table of contents. What, what is the problem with this table of contents here? Yeah, so. Here, here, it should not be the case that everything starts at the very same line at the beginning. So 
it would be more structured or the structure would be better visible if let's say this would be a little bit shifted to the right. And if this would be also a little bit shifted to the right, and if this would be shifted to the right, and if these, the last um, four subsections here, if they would be even more shifted to the right. More ideas? Yeah, there are page numbers, but they are they are here. The, so the, the S is, stands for the German Seite, which translates into page. So there, there are page numbers here, but hmm, yeah, they, they, they have been inserted by hand and they should be they should be aligned really to the right and there, then there might be some some space in between. So if I go back to my browser window here and if I go back to the introduction and scroll up a little bit, uh, to find a table of contents here. So this is how a proper table of contents should look like. And um, so I cannot click on the page numbers here, but as I said, I can click on this and then I go to page eight uh, where this section starts. Okay, so the same content, uh, the same table of contents, just really formatted as the table of contents would look like this. And as mentioned here, Main sections are really on the left and the subsections are a little bit aligned to the right. These sub subsections are aligned more to the right and so on. And once again, we have different fonts, different font style to mark these different sections. Okay, this is also a very nice um, example of, of a bad diagram. What happened here in this diagram? F is probably frequency, and they should be they, the this label should be somewhere here. Exactly, and this Q should be somewhere here, and it would be. I said if you look onto this and you don't read the report and just look at the figure, it would be more meaningful if the Q here would also say quality factor maybe here. But okay, quality factor with response, maybe respect to frequency. It's some still somewhat self-explaining. Um, other issues with this figure? Say once again. The, uh, the grid lines are missing would be more good if we would, yeah, if, if I would ask you, is this peak here above 5,000 or below 5,000? Probably difficult to tell because there is no no grid line here close to this peak. Other issues with this figure? Hello to the six people on Twitch. You can also write something in the chat. I have my cell phone open here. You can, I will read your messages. Yeah, but I think the line is not smooth because in this example, it was only measured every 20, 25 megahertz or so. And if you would smooth the line, you would kind of mask this effect. Um, and no one would know anymore at which frequency something was measured. It would probably be a good idea to mark, to make the points where the measurement has really been done a little thicker and to make the line maybe a little thinner. The line is still very meaningful for our eye to follow the curve, especially if you would have more than one curve in a diagram. But in, in this case here, um, this linear interpolation between the points is just a lucky guess. It's, it's not really a measurement. It's just uh, no one knows what is happening between this and this point. The, the line is just a guess. Could be like this. No one knows. Um, but probably there is much more movement there. So I would say, um, why do we have this gray background there? Does not make any sense. It's because it's a screenshot from MATLAB, from the MATLAB window. And if I zoom in, you can see the figure quality is not really pleasing. It's a raster graphic and it's inserted as a JPEG form. Not really a good figure. Um, same figure. Um, in an improved format now, we have saying quality factor Q, we have 
uh, frequency f in megahertz. The, the, the quality factor is unitless. There is no unit there. It's dimensionless. Same figure caption measured quality factor as a function of frequency. Um, and now if I zoom, yeah, we don't have this gray background anymore. The, the, the numbers, the font style is maybe a little larger. And if I zoom in, you, you can see now it's always looking good because this is a vector graphic. This is not a raster graphic. Okay, next example. This is <laughs> it's always interesting how people react. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what was what what went wrong here? Uh, for almost each and everything. So I think this figure probably was created in, in Microsoft Paint, I don't know. And it was, it probably has been resized, made smaller and larger and smaller and larger. And some elements have been later, have been added later on because some are very, um, yeah, I don't know how to say this. So, so there, there seems to be lots of noise here around this, but this element here on the other side, this one seems to be kind of sharp, but the numbers are very, very small. The resolution is very, very bad. It's really challenging and difficult to see something here in this in this figure. Um, so this would be a more pleasing way to have this uh, with clear labels. Once again, this is a vector format. If I zoom in here, this is always looking looking good and nice. And so at, at this example, and at this example, we will look in a second in, in more detail. There's a question. Um, what, what would you like to show in a legend? Um, I mean, in, the, in, in, the, in a plot like this? For, for the next one, and what would you like to show in the legend? And you mean in the um, in the legend, it would be explained that this is the symbol of a, of a current source, and this is a symbol of a resistance of a resistor. I it it depends on the audience of the report. Let's say I would I would assume if you write a laboratory protocol in a university context, I think you can assume that every reader will understand these symbols. If you write a technical note, some application note or a data sheet for some I don't know uh, some some circuit uh, um, compo or some some electronic component that you develop i think there would there's also no legend um, like this because everyone who will read this data sheet should be aware of what these symbols mean um if you if you write an article for a newspaper um, about some technical stuff some, I don't know, some research that you did in your study, um, then it might be a good idea to explain these symbols because you cannot assume that every reader of the general newspaper will be aware of this. Um, but in general, I would say no. There, there, there will be no legend here because the legend is commonly agreed. There are these standardized symbols on what this means. And there's just, let's say, the difference between we have European symbols and there are American symbols. We come back to this later on, but still there are generally agreed symbols. This is a voltage source. This is the current source. This is a transistor. Uh, this is this and that. So I would not add the legend for such circuit schematics. One more question. You mean if you have the real setup in the lab bench? By hand? And then take a photograph? Yeah, it depends. So I would say for um, you have a laboratory course in every week 
over a full semester, every week you need to deliver a, a lab report or some protocol, then maybe you don't have enough time to each and every week really invest the time to draw it in a quality like this. Then it's sometimes okay if you take, I don't know, a, a nice white, white sheet of paper, if you take a blackboard, if you take a whiteboard like this, draw the schematic there, try to make a high quality photograph of it. Um, I would say it's, it's probably okay. Yeah, but for for a conference paper, for um, th then of course you would you would go and invest the time to make it in the in the best quality that you can afford. But I mean here, every every quick sketch on the blackboard is looking better than this one here. Let's say, yeah, but. It's a, it's a good question. So I I can I can I I know that I have written also a kind of scientific papers um, about stuff here yeah, about our stuff that we do in fundamentals of electrical engineering with the with the personalized tasks where you get the task and they are generated in latex and they will be stored on our Moodle and you get them by email and you you review your fellow students and so on. You you know what I mean. The system with the and so there's a huge flow chart. Um, how this works. So what the students do, what my server does, what the Moodle does, how, how each and everything in the system is connected with each other. And this is also what I've drawn on some electronic, on a smart board. I've drawn it by hand on a smart board and I've directly saved it as a PDF file. So it's not a photograph, it's, a, it's really a vector graphic, but it, let's say it's a hand-drawn vector graphic. Um, and I've also used this in scientific publications, no one complained because the quality is good and it would also, I don't know, take probably three hours to replicate it in ticks or in, to replicate it in, into some vector graphic program. And at the end, it would not look too much. It would not look much better. And if you have a nice style of handwriting, um, I would say, why not? It can, can, can look good. Okay. Um, so, okay, next, next example. Um, what is this is this is uh, more on the on the content what is what is strange here say again what is too long the description the description maybe i yeah i would say uh, as, as it, uh, sometimes i would have it rather too long than rather too short um, and for this list of figures, you could also have a short version. Does someone uh, else has an idea? Figure yeah, figure figure showing. I mean, this is this is yeah, this is probably if you if you have a figure and below the figure, the caption says figure two two point one, figure showing something this and this. It's it's like if you if you write a research paper and call it research on. Every research paper will show research on. There must not be in the title research on something like this and that. And so it's the same. So we can, without any problems, we can remove this figure showing and just say, okay, experimental result for this and this. And so now the thing is that you have the same caption here and the same caption here and the same caption there. So the next step to improve this would be to take maybe one figure and call this one figure experimental results for the measurement or for the resonant resonance curves, and then have this first measured frequency, second measured frequency, third measured frequency as subfigures in this figure, as subfigure A, subfigure B, subfigure C. You, you know what I mean? Because then you don't have this redundancy here, which is. Um, I mean, in this case, it's not not so not so bad because you can directly see the difference. But sometimes people have five times the very same, almost very same caption, and then it's like this, like the like the game for children. Sometimes in the newspaper, where you need to spot the differences. What is the difference between the different captions? Um, so here it's here it's still more or less clear. Sure. Yeah, if there is text in between the figures, then it's maybe not a good idea to combine them into one figure. It, it depends on the context. I mean, here we can see that 
they are obviously on following pages. So here it would be no problem at all probably to combine them into, um, into one figure. Okay, and the last example um, is, yes, yeah, really more, once again, more about the content. So um, it's a screenshot from, from Somosilloscope. So I think this is from the German Fundamentals of Electric Engineering Laboratory course. Um, May you could see it's some tectronic scope that we use a lot. And of course, because it's a screenshot, it's a raster graphic. So if I zoom in, you will see single pixels, but it's not looking too bad. And okay, it's it's JPEG compression, but we at this moment we might not care about this. But what is wrong with this figure? And do you have an idea what is wrong? Yeah, so there's I would I would probably hide all this information here. All the menu buttons, and there is probably also something that you could select on the instrument to, to turn off the menu for the screenshot because it's just confusing. You don't need this. And there's also, okay, the time, the date, how many points, and so on and so on. So there's lots of lots of numbers, lots of information on this in this plot. And the the essential information, because what should have been done here is this should be some oscillogram to measure the periodic time. So we have this sawtooth or triangular pulse strain function. And the purpose of this experiment was to measure, obviously was to measure the periodic time. Now I'm asking you, what is the periodic time of this function? <laughs> it once again, very interesting. What, 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 to, what, what people do, so, uh, so the, the, there is a suggestion to say it's 200 microseconds. But the 200 microseconds given here, is it the periodic time? Who, who has experience with oscilloscope measurements? Experiment? Okay, so I think this, the, the time given here, so th this is exactly the problem. Yeah? So this should sh show us or help the reader in, uh, getting some idea what is the periodic time that has been measured there. And we find lots of numbers, really lots of numbers in this figure, but not the periodic time. And so the two, okay, if we check for times, there's a time given here and there's a time given there. And uh, these are all the times given here. And maybe this is, okay, this is the, the, the time of the day. But the 200 microseconds, 200 microseconds given here, this is the, the time per division. This is the time between one element within this grid. And so we can see the, the function replicates from here to here. And this is a little bit before this grid. And this is a little bit before the center. So we have, let's say, 200 microseconds, another 200 microseconds, and 100 microseconds. So the, the periodic time should be 500 microseconds in this example. And if you calculate the frequency of 500 microseconds, which is 0 0.5 milliseconds, you should get which frequency? At, at one millisecond, you get one kilohertz of frequency. And at half a, micro, a, half a millisecond, if we half the time, if we, if we cu cut the time in half, we should double the frequency, right? So we should get two kilohertz of frequency. And we can see this is here. So there's, there's a marker here and there's a marker there. And the, the, the frequency that comes from the delta measurement between these two markers is more or less exactly two kilohertz, which would correspond to this 500 microseconds of periodic time. So the periodic time is probably 500 microseconds, but it's very, very difficult and challenging and just took us three minutes to discuss 
what is superiority kind. So this um, diagram is just not very helpful in delivering the message or in helping a reader to get an idea what was the measured periodic time here. It's more or less, it's confusing people. It's trying to hide this information from people. What is the periodic time in this example? And there's a, um, there's, there's a comment in the chat from the twitchy microwave that who, who says, half of the oscilloscopes in my colleague's lab are broken and never have and have never been replaced. Yeah, so so sad for you. But I think these, how is it? it I've it, I've not been in our student lab for a long time. Our oscilloscopes, most of them should be working fine, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, the first one was broken, got replaced. I think these tectonic scopes, they are also kind of reliable, I would say. And if as, as long as if you leave them in the one mega ohm input mode, not, not so much can go wrong because they have high ohmic input. Even if you apply high voltage, there will be no high current and no high power going into the oscilloscope. Um, yeah, but thanks for the comment. Okay, so to improve this, as discussed, hide the menu, use better settings for vertical horizontal resolution and try somewhere, try to show um, what you have really measured. And instead of this lossy JPEG compression here for this figure, it would be better to use this PNG portable network graphics, which is a lossless compression format. So it does not introduce this nasty compression artifacts, but this PNG compression only works for pictures with few colors only. But if we go back, there are not so many uh, colors in this figure. So this, here, this would, be a, would be very good to compress it in a PNG um, way of compression. Okay, and now we can check the last example. And this is kind of small, so I can maybe zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so some comments about this. So the formula is not numbered. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes we have a hyphen, which is the short one. Sometimes we have a dash, which, which is this longer one. Here, this equation is numbered, but the number should be, should be to the right. There should be no units within this equation. We can skip these units. Maybe if it's necessary for the understanding, maybe we could add the units here. Okay, I think these are the main points. So let me zoom out once again and go to the next page where I've tried to improve this a little bit. So here the equation is without the units. The equation is properly numbered. And then I've written it in a way that, uh, that all the quantities are explained in a sentence. And then we have a second equation and so on. Or you could also write it in a way that we would say, okay, where this is the angular frequency, this is, I don't know, the energy density or the stored energy and the average dissipated power. And, and then the second equation would look like this. Yeah, and here it's, it's not with a hyphen, not with a dash, it's just with some space between the quantity and the explanation. Say, say once again, I... Um, so I would never, or in only in seldom cases where it's really, really necessary, because sometimes you have these fitted quantity equations where the equation only works if you insert quantities in a, in a proper unit, um, then I would add, then you, you, you need to add these units to the formula. But in the general case, I would never add units to the formula. And sometimes, um, yeah, so if it's, I don't know, helpful for the reader or for the understanding, or if it really matters, if you have still kind of some kind of special units, then I would add them here in the explanation and say, this is the angular frequency. And then maybe in parentheses, measured in one over second or in radians per second or something like this. And energy stored in the reverb chamber 
in parentheses in joules or what, what not. But um, I would say in general, everyone should know, okay, the energy has this proper unit, the power has this proper unit and so on. Mm, okay. So then we can, can come to a last poll, um, which is once again related to LaTeX. And I need to find my browser once again and go to all these polls and go to once again, maybe I will find this here. Um, so I will start this for one minute and show the QR code and go to full screen mode. And I think I can already disable the QR code. We have about 10 more seconds. And the options is why, why are you not using LaTeX? Or what was your biggest fear before using it? Um, and let's see what the results today show. We have once again, six uh, persons attending. Okay, not aware of it. Okay, you, sh you should be aware now. Uh, too complicated, yeah. I think you need to. There's, there's quite a, quite a learning curve. Um, it's only what is this? Too time consuming. Um, yeah, maybe. So I would say at the end, it's not faster or slower than if you write it in Word or in any any other system. Um, at least if you are, if you have some experience. Um, and you don't have more or less problems it, as if you do it in Word or, or, or in any other system, um, you just have other problems. But still, at the end, I would say you get a better result. You get a more high quality result if you do it in LaTeX. And no one said it's only used in academics, not in the industry. And um, I see lots of advantages, but okay. So now we can take a look short look onto these examples. And the first example with the PGF plots is we have, we take this ticks package, um, which is a general pack package for figures. And inside this, we use this access environment, which, which comes from this PGF plots package. And, and the idea here is if you can create such a figure in MATLAB, where you also sometimes have to use strange commands, I think you can also do it here. So there's a general uh, command that adds a plot. And so here I give, um, let's say an X range and a number of samples and directly give a formula. And now this formula is calculated with 101 values between zero and 20 that are used for this X. And so this LaTeX source code, these LaTeX commands will create this figure. And so now next step, of course, is we would like to add some labels. So we can add some X label, add some Y label and say, this is time voltage and so on with this uh, quantity and this in this unit. And we will get labels. And figures already looking nice. Uh, now my, maybe we would really like to start here and stop here. So we drop the axis a little bit, say, our X axis should go from this to this, the Y axis should go from this to that. And then figure looks like this. Um, and now we can maybe try to enlarge the figure a little bit. So we say figure should be, should have 80% of the text width as the width and maybe 50% of the text width as the height. And then the figure would look like this. And now you can see that LaTeX automatically added some more numbers here. Um, and okay, figure is not looking too bad um, already. And so 
Now we could add the second plot and then maybe because now we have two lines in the diagram at the legend and you can see now it's getting a little more complicated and so on and so on here. So now we have two curves, we have a legend. Um, and the good thing is we separate content from style. So we have just written what should be the content of our figure and the style what font is used here? What font size is used? What colors are used for the lines? This is defined in the general style of the template. So if you don't change it, all your figures will have automatically, we have the same style and you can also um, change the style. And then it will change for all the figures in your document. You could, we, we, by changing one line, you can change all figures from colored lines into grayscale lines, for example, in your latex document. Or you can you can copy a figure from your report into your presentation and it will automatically change the front, the font type from the report into the font type of the presentation. That's the big advantage. This is where you where you save later on save some time by using latex. And there are lots of other options for this PGF plot package. You can not only directly insert formulas, as in my example here, you can also insert tables. You can also write data points directly in your latex document. Um, and it can not only do line plots like the one that I've shown you, you can also do bar plots and quiver plots and Smith charts and ternary diagrams and surface plots and, and everything, more or less everything that you can do in MATLAB is on Octave or Python Matplotlib is that you can also do in LaTeX without problems. Okay, so then um, we can look at the circuit schematic example. And for this, I need to have my drawing tablet here um, to explain this a little bit what happens here. So once again, we have... Um, Ooh, this was wrong. So I will try to share my screen once again. Um, I need to this commenting feature here. Mm. So once again, we have this text picture. And Think of a coordinate system. So I will try to draw some coordinate axes. So we have a Y axis and some X axis, like in a diagram. So this is X and this is Y. And now we have some points in this diagram. And I will say, okay, he he here at this position, um, my, my axes are now not, not at zero, but here will be the point zero and zero. And let's say here is the point. So this will be the point zero and zero. And this will be, will be the point zero and four. And now this says from this point zero, zero to the point zero and four, we will draw um, a current source. So this will be the current source. Then going from this position to the next one, which is 4.4, this would be somewhere here. This is the point 4.4 or 4,4. Uh, we will have just a short circuit. So we have this short here. Maybe, maybe I should use different lines. So this is... This is the, um, or different colors. This is the current source. This is the short circuit. So then for the next element, we have a variable resistor, uh, which goes to 4.2. 4.2 would be somewhere here. And then we have a variable resistor going to this position. This is the variable resistor. This is this one here. So then the next element would be a resistor going to this position here. And then we have a short connection 
that goes back to this position. So this would be here 4.2 because here is the two for the y or for the yeah for the for the y um, coordinate and here would be the 4.0. Coordinate. And this is the way how you would draw such circuit schematics or how you would also draw other more general schematics in this way. Think of a coordinate system and now we say, okay, from one point to another point, there will be an element, there will be an element, there will be an element like this. Okay, so that's, that's the general idea. Um, I will try to save this and now maybe remove it once again and look at my output here so this is what i've just drawn this is just the, the example and so the next step would be we need to have these inner branches some other variable resistor some other resistor some other resistor then we would need to get or we would get these inner branches remember this is the example that i've shown you before and so what would be the next step we might want to have these soldering dots here these connection dots and we would like to have labels. So we can add labels. I think here at first I'm adding labels. And now we've added labels. Now it looks like this. So what's the problem now? From overprinted, the labels are too long. So now, of course, we what we could do is we could now change all these coordinates and, and change the numbers to change the distance. But think of if you have a larger schematic, it would be very time consuming. So there, there, there should be, there must be an easier way to do this. And there is. So we can just change the scaling of this diagram. We can say, okay, in the X direction, we want to scale it to 160%. And in the Y direction, we would also like to scale it a little bit, maybe to 1.220%. So just by changing these two lines, now the result looks like this and the labels fit. And then the next step is what I do here and here, for example. So at the beginning and at the end of the line or at the beginning and the end of the line, these where these inner branches, I add the soldering dots. So this command here, for example, or this, this statement will add this dot here. And the next one will add the dot here. And the last one would at the, at the beginning and end of this line, the soldering dots. And this circuit text package um, has also has all the elements that you need for monopoles, for bipoles, for tri tripoles like transistors, double bipoles like transformers, couplers, something like this. And you can introduce, um, as you've seen, current and voltage arrows. You can um, also label nodes, for example, for, for nodal analyzers. And you can also change the style from English or from European to American and vice versa. And it will also do this for the whole document, if you like, because once again, you separate content from style. That's a big advantage of latex. Okay, oops. Sure. So this, the scaling here just scales the coordinates. It does not scale the elements and it does not scale the font. So it, it, in, in this case, it really just um, changes these points in, in, in the coordinate system that we have seen before. But now, um, as you can see, this resistor, even if this distance is scaled to 160%, the resistor is not getting longer and the font is not, the, the text is not getting longer. Just, you just scale the coordinates. And, and once again, I mean, this is the advantage of you. And you don't want to scale the resistor. You don't want to scale the font. You just want to scale the coordinates. This is, the, the, these uh, packages have been developed by persons keeping the requirements for scientific and technical publishing and writing in mind. Um, so yeah, I think big advantage. And so this would be interesting, maybe, and this would be the last poll for today. 
Um, and then we can shortly wrap up. We are a little bit over time, but I think it's still somewhat okay. Um, what latest related topics would you like to see in future editions of such workshops? And there's the QR code. Um, and there is Daiso20 saying hello in the chat. Hello, Beck. Uh, nice that you joined. You can also participate in the survey for sure. <laughs> and the question is, can, can I solve G advanced question? I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can. Um, the G E E I think is some. Excuse me. Yeah. Can we just Cancel the and just add a note. Yeah, you could, you could, you could. There are always different ways on to how to solve a problem. I mean, you could, you could also just man manually uh, shift the coordinates. But in in the example that I've shown you, I think the simplest thing is just to rescale the whole figure. And you could also um, probably it's not a nice idea. So I think. Um, survey is over. Let's let's shortly discuss the results and come back to it. Okay, so typesetting formulas is the most popular. Um, citing sources, drawing schematic, almost each and everything. But some people also say don't bother. No, no, no one said don't bother me with related. I'm I'm confusing the. I should look at the numbers here. So creating presentation slides and typesetting formulas and citing sources. Okay. I will keep this in mind. I will send this to my former colleagues. And there's the explanation for the chat. So G is an Indian entrance exam. Yeah, I thought of this before. I don't know what the abbreviation stands for. I think it's like our German Abitur. Um, maybe, maybe I can solve advanced questions. Maybe not. Um, I've, I've never tried. So uh, coming shortly coming back to this example, I would say what would be also probably okay in this diagram is just to, in the circuit schematic, is just to have R and R2. And, and uh, what, what's making this long is the value here. And maybe the value could be added in a text or could be added in a table or could be added in a caption. Um, because if you have longer and more larger and more complicated circuit schematics, these labels here, they will consume lots of space. Um, but in this example, it's maybe maybe useful to have them like this. Okay, so uh, there's some. Okay, so quick summary at the end. Um, if you submit a protocol, the supervisor, the advisor of the experiment, should see that you have taken care that you have not just written it very quickly uh, within the last two minutes of the evening before, and the effort that you put into writing such protocols, uh, at least for our German students in their fundamentals of electrical engineering courses and their bachelor courses towards the end really, really pays off because they, they gain lots of experience and it really helped them, really, I think, helps them a lot in writing their bachelor thesis and also writing later on their master um, thesis. And so depending on where you come from and how many of this stuff you have done in your home university, you, you might also um, have have an advantage because of this experience or maybe not. Yeah. So, okay. Um, this depends. Yeah. So, but um, okay. I think mean, then I would say thanks for your attention. Um, I always say bye bye to this person, and and yeah, so I, I still have more time for questions. If you have more questions, uh -huh. yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you do it for just one diagram, it probably does not make too much sense. Yeah, then then it then it makes sense. And so if you if you only need to draw one of such circuit diagrams in your whole study, it probably does not really pay off to learn the circuit text for this. But if you if you draw three, then 
or, or more, I would say, then it's uh, it's already worth it. And of course, there is some learning curve. But these for this for these uh, diagrams for the for the former example here, I think this is oops, this is not too complicated to do so. And if I really go to my to my last slide uh, to show you these links, mm, and I'm I will also. I don't know. Um, you, you can make a picture of them if you like. I will also share the recording probably in the NTPS course where most of you might still be enrolled into it. Um, I, I can click on this in a second if you are, if you are finished with your uh, with your photo. So if you click on this, it should hopefully bring you. Uh, to the Overleaf online editor, and I won't change stuff here because I'm I'm logged in and will just change the the document. I think so. Um, but here you exactly get this example, and you can look at the source code of this example, and you can also look at the settings. And there are some tasks given here. So what you can try with this example. Um, Try to change the width and height of the figure, remove the cosine waveform, maybe at the third line, uh, change the general settings and so on. And the second link will directly give you or pinpoint you to the second example with the circuit schematic. And here you can see here, it's now it's switched to American symbols. Um, so there are also some tasks here and you can look at this example there. And this is maybe also a nice concluding sentence and some last advice that I would give you if you are really trying to do something with LaTeX, it's always a very good idea to find examples that have where, where people have almost done the same thing that you would like to have. Take, take this example at the basis, try to learn from this and try to change it in a way that you would like to have. But of course, what is really, really challenging is to start from scratch, to start with a blank document and then generate everything from scratch, because then you really have to know all the commands, all the packages, all the settings, each and everything. So um, it's always good to start with these examples and you will find, if you if you search with the proper terms, LaTeX, TIGS, PGF plots, and so on, and the internet is full of such examples. And there's also a TIX gallery and a PGF gallery uh, where, you, where you find simple and more complicated examples. I think from my point of view, most of the examples that are given there are already kind of complicated. So as a starting point, they have already super complicated, or most of the time you will find super complicated examples. And I mean, I think these examples are simple enough to understand them in like these five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes that we discussed uh, these examples and they still show the potential um, that this language has or that these packages offer to create various documents.